This is a course of lectures and discussions on economics. This is the first of two sessions in which I explore the claims of economics to be a science, like physics or, or chemistry. And crucial to that claim is that economic systems can be modelled or explained as equilibrium systems. In other words, equilibrium is crucial to the claim of economics to be a science, like gravity in the natural sciences. But why should economic systems tend towards equilibrium? I mean, what's the equivalent of, of gravity that keeps markets uh, uh, in order? And when we look into that, um, we find many, many difficulties because it's not clear. We, we understand that it's a force of nature in the natural sciences, but we're not absolutely sure what the equivalent is in economics. But nevertheless, that is the claim of economics, that um, it is governed by laws which are um, essentially similar uh, to the laws of gravity in physics. <laughs> Is economics a science like physics or chemistry? Well, I would say no, and perhaps most people here would say no, but most economists do think of economics as a science. The economic world, they say, is a predictable system, just like the natural world. This is because it's governed by reliable, measurable motives, which can be treated as causes. This means that the test of a successful economic model is its predictive power. It's because of its ability to make quantitative predictions that Paul Samuelson called economics the queen of the social sciences. Numbers are its tools. Most of today's economics is mathematical. That is, it tells its story in equations and statistics. This is because most economists think that reality can only be precisely stated in mathematical form. That this cuts economics off from most people's understanding does not phase most economists. Mainstream economists believe that a story which cannot be told in maths is not part of economics, but of some other scientifically inferior discipline, like history or sociology or literature. Uh, maths enables economics to look like a science, but is it actually a science? If so, what kind of science is it? Uh, you can put on the uniform of a policeman, but does that make you a policeman? The main idea economics shares with the natural sciences is the idea of equilibrium. If equilibrium is a groundless idea, then economics' is claim to be a hard science collapses. Equilibrium is absolutely crucial to economics' claim to be a hard science. The economist Schumpeter described equilibrium as the magna carta of economic theory. The general idea is that there exist forces in nature which balance each other. Any disturbance to the balance will set up an opposing force to rebalance the system. It comes out of natural science, this uh, thinking about the world. Galileo glimpsed the operation of equilibrium in the curved line drawn by the moon as it circled the earth. Kepler was then able to describe accurately the path it took from which Newton deduced the concept of gravity, a field of force which pulls matter together. No one has ever seen gravity. It was a hypothesis to explain Kepler's observation and many others since. A reliable hypothesis, as it turned out. Mainstream e economists believe that the economic world exhibits something like the principle of gravity. As the economist Alfred Marshall wrote, if a stone hanging by a string is displaced from an equilibrium position, the force of gravity will at once tend to bring it back to its equilibrium position. Now, he wrote that about economics. He was using an analogy, the analogy of the natural world, to explain the concept of equilibrium in economics. Economic equilibrium is secured by the forces of supply and demand. 
the elementary supply and demand diagram shows the quantity of a good which will be demanded and the quantity supplied at different prices. The price of something goes up, the quantity sold goes down. This price goes down and the quantity sold goes up. Now, that seems straightforward and probably quite reasonable, you might think, in a, in, a, in a single market, in a local place. Although why that should be so is something we need to talk about. But economists have extended the notion to the equilibrium of the whole system of interdependent markets. And that is the general equilibrium, the theory of Léon Valras, a 19th century French mathematician, who reasoned that if the whole economy consisted of perfect auction markets, which would include all markets for future contracts as well as present contracts, supplies and demands would always be balanced throughout the system, always, instantaneously, the whole time. There'd never be any slumps. There couldn't be. And he'd shown it arithmetically that this was so. Must be right. In Valrasian general equilibrium, each market establishes its market clearing price through a process he called groping. I'm not sure he'd use that word um, today. Um, at the point of trade, all prices in the economy have been perfectly adjusted to the supply and demand conditions in each market. Thus, equilibrium is a state in which market, the market has allocated resources so that all the participants, producers and consumers, have got what they set out to get. They have no motive to change their position. Marshall's pendulum does not swing. Well, despite all these sort of mathematical scaffoldings, um, equilibrium in economics is a minefield which can easily blow up in your face. So there are many problems with it, but I just want to concentrate on, say, three of them, open them up to discussion. First, what is actually meant by equilibrium, other than just a sort of banal description? Uh, secondly, is the tendency to equilibrium a good description of actual behavior in markets? And third, what in human behavior is the equivalent to the force of gravity which brings equilibrium about in the natural world? What is it that pushes down the price of a good in excess supply or pushes up the price of a good in excess demand? What causes the market to behave like a seesaw? Well, first, the problem of equilibrium. There are so many so-called equilibria that it's very hard to know, you know which one is being used. They're the short-run equilibria, long-run equilibria, um, static equilibria, uh, temporary equilibria, bootstraps equilibria, Nash equilibria, expectational equilibria, real equilibria. Um, uh, and, and they all seem to be, we, we seem to, um, they're, they're used rather promiscuously. The word equilibrium um, encompasses the whole lot. And we need to be very, very clear um, about which equilibria we're talking about in, 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 in any particular topic of interest. Um, but at least we, I think, have to distinguish between three types. First of all, an optimal equilibrium. I think that's a situation in which everyone's profit or utility is maximized, so no one can do better than they are doing by changing their behavior. And I think that really only applies to a situation not just um, created by the market, but the general potential um, of, of, of the economic activity. It, it, it is fully realized. Um, uh, and that would be an optimal equilibrium. We can discuss it a bit more. Then there's the Keynesian underemployment equilibrium, in which a labor surplus coexists with a, a deficiency of demand. Supply and demand are, are out, of, out of phase, but there's nothing that, that can be done about it within the market, and therefore it's a static situation. Here, the equilibrium is not a point of optimal deployment of resources, but a point of rest. It's just a point 
of rest. Nothing, no one has any incentive to change it within, within the market system. A Cain, uh, within that market, a Keynesian equilibrium arises when the business class can do no more investment than it's doing because of the state of effective demand. In other words, Keynes makes the quality of the equilibrium dependent on the quantity of demand in, in the economy. It's a macroeconomic concept. Uh, there's a lot of argument, by the way, um, about whether the Keynesian equilibrium is a temporary equilibrium or whether it can persist. Uh, and if it's temporary, for how long? Uh, so that's, that's the argument about that. Then there's a third type of equilibrium, which is dynamic equilibrium, in which all the quantities which determine the equilibrium are changing at the same speed or the same rate. So the relative ratios of prices and quantities are unaffected. So three types of equilibria, many more. Now, a second problem is this. Does the notion of pendulum swings have any power to explain the actual movement of economies through time? Is the idea of movement more accurately explained by the notion of disequilibrium than by transitions between two points of equilibrium? That needs to be talked about. As for the third question, what is the economist's equivalent to the law of gravity? The answer is contained in a single powerful hypothesis, and that is self-interest. Self-interest is the gravitational force which makes economic behavior as predictable as the behavior of the planets. You can always rely on X's self-interest to achieve the result you know, that you perhaps are, are aiming for. Uh, if you can assume that market participants are reliably governed by self-interest, then, so the argument goes, you can reliably predict what they will pay for a quantity of something. Self-interest isn't just greed, it's rational greed. And to achieve a good equilibrium, markets have to be fully decentralized or competitive. And the rational greed, I mean, the rational greed, of course, is, you know, you can apply that, that concept um, to um, uh, uh, monopolistic markets, but still, in a monopolistic market, it, that's not the best possible state of affairs for everyone, but it can be quite uh, stable with the, the monopolist being a rational agent. If Marshall's pendulum is set in motion by unexpected sh shocks, how long does it swing before it stops swinging. In other words, how long are deviations from equilibrium supposed to last? Most mainstream economists would say that given the conditions of rationality, assumed conditions of rationality, and perfect information and those sort of things, the swings will be short and shallow. That was, of course, the assumption after 2008, 2009. There'd be a V-shaped, very, very brief, economy collapses, within a month it's up again. You know, something like that. Therefore, you know, it didn't have to do anything. It was a great surprise when it seemed that wasn't happening. But how long are these deviations? The idea that um, equilibria, once disturbed, take time to reestablish themselves, has given rise to the crucially important idea of frictions. Gravitation in physics depends on the existence of a vacuum. The law of gravitation has high predictability because uh, frictions are uh, very small. But nothing like a vacuum exists in economic life. There's always a lot of friction. These frictions are caused by human beings. Unfortunately, their existence, unfortunately, is, a, is, is something that can't be ignored, uh, even by economic theory. So um, the existence of frictions then seems crucial to the defense of equilibrium. 
this word, taken from physical and engineering sciences, signifies a resistance to the efficient sliding together of parts of the market system. Frictions do a huge amount of work in maintaining the grand theory of equilibrium economics by explaining the possibility of deviations from it without endangering the core doctrine. The existence of frictions, such as, and one of the most famous frictions, of course, is sticky wages, it might explain persisting unemployment. Um, to the fervent globalist, national frontiers are frictions to the more perfect integration of markets. When humans are shown not to possess the properties needed for perfect efficiency, they too become frictions. Now, the prescription for frictions is to try and minimize them so as to maximize market efficiency. Neoclassical e economists see no great difficulty about doing this. To minimize the length and severity of frictions was the main aim of the rational expectations revolution of the 1970s. The promise of continually fulfilled expectations gives neoclassical economics its, a lot of its crusading zeal. I think this whole way of thinking about economies, uh, the, the, their tendency, natural te tendency to equilibrium, the shallowness uh, of, of, of the frictions, has a baleful effect on policy. It leads to the unthinking belief in the automatic tendency of a market system to an optimal or at least satisfactory equilibrium, provided it's not interfered with. Therefore, the best policy is laissez-faire. Let things be. Um, and that sort of persists, really, all the way through the history of economics, despite all the exceptions. In conclusion, what is the status of equilibrium theory today? It's still implicit, I would argue, in neoclassical reasoning. Even if not literally believed in, it is clung to as a sort of benchmark needed to judge imperfect um, performance. Rather like you need a model answer if you have an exam question, you need a model answer, you set them, then you say, well, that's seven out of ten, or that's, you know. Uh, uh, but you, you could do better. You could do better if you have this model. Um, heterodox e economists have abandoned the notion of a natural tendency of markets towards an e optimum equilibrium. Keynes pointed out that the economy doesn't self-correct itself through relative price adjustment. As, uh, as equilibrium theory claims. All prices tend to move one way or another as a consequence um, of production decreasing or increasing. It's important in understanding the Keynesian um, system to, to understand that he um, uh, didn't abandon the idea of equilibrium in his model, only he thought that the equilibria, um, w that most equilibria weren't optimal. Since then, Others have abandoned the idea of equilibrium entirely as self-contradictory. An, an economy in, in motion can't have points of rest. Um, well, it can, but I mean, why should it? Caldor, Lachman, Robinson, Shackle um, have all argued that ignorance excludes the use of equilibrium models, ignorance about what the future will bring. Schumpeter is, is, is a tormented soul. Um, he clings to the idea of equilibrium, but of course his famous notion of creative destruction is quite contrary to it. Equilibrium refers to an economy of given, known, and constant external conditions, such as tastes and technology, and Schumpeter proves that these are always in flux. So, he wants to be a neoclassical economist, but his genius keeps breaking through, and he can't do it. But apparently, in the last days of his life, he was doing simultaneous equations and all kinds of things just to sort of prove to himself that he could do some maths. In the Schumpeterian analysis that's come down to us, 
um, external conditions not only change, but such change is fundamental to a capitalist economy. Entrepreneurs try out innovations, which in a process of creative destruction replaces tried methods. Increasing destruction of age-old relationships for the sake of progress. That's how Schumpeter described Where is equilibrium in this? It's going on the whole time. Marx said exactly the same thing. Capitalism is constantly revolutionizing the means of production and the social relationships of each productive uh, a, a stage. So just to end, how do we explain um, the continued hold of equilibrium thinking? First, it's explained by the longing of economists for the certainty of the natural sciences. Second is the conviction that underneath the messiness of appearances, there exists an underlying order which can be captured by logic and maths. This goes all the way back to Descartes. Equilibrium is thus a mental construct designed to explain a feature of na nature which is not evident when you first see it, when you look at it, namely the principle of orderliness. I have one final reflection on equilibrium, just reverting to, to it as a notion of balance. Um, if um, a principle of balance exists in social life, it's something much wider than the balance of the market. The market is just part of that wider balance. Um, it lies in the natural tendency of an excess in one direction, producing its opposite. And I think that is the basis of historical cycles, the cycles that have interested historians, not just economists. I'm not just talking about Kondratiev cycles or Yugla cycles or the cycles that economists do recognize as deviations um, or exceptions from their general notion of, of equilibrium. I'm talking about, you know, full, full blooded historical cycles, the rise and decay of certain civilizations, um, the, the, the alternation between democracy and authoritarianism or dictatorship, the alternation between puritanism and excess, puritanism and licentiousness. I mean, these things. Uh, go on all through history. And they do tend to, in the end, produce some balance as one excess is cancelled out and, 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 and leads to this pendulum swinging back. Um, and these, uh, but these cycles are far too loose um, to have the precision required um, for the prediction of specific events. So I wouldn't repudiate the idea of equilibrium and the pendulum swinging but uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a much broader idea than, 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 than the economist's notion of equilibrium.